website, lenhouse.com, his books that he's written, and then he has a YouTube channel that you can get a great uh, uh, amount of resources from. So would you welcome Dr. Lynn House as he comes to share with us here tonight. Hallelujah. And we are honored to be here every year like this. We have become great friends with uh, Jamie and Lisa Wright. want to kind of maybe develop them so if you help me do that it, we would appreciate it let me say again first of all it's good to have pastor brad joseph here tonight and it's also good to have pastor uh, seth fleming here tonight it, uh, for those of you who like our ministry we will be with pastor seth fleming next saturday night and sunday morning in kanawa city is that what you call it and if you want directions to that i've never been there yet so you could see him after the service and he can tell you where that's at. It's good to meet you. It's good to have you here tonight with us. If you open your Bible or your device, whatever the case may be, it might be a little louder here. is really full of an exodus paradigm. And I think we established pretty well last night in whatever the service was how all through the scriptures, I don't know if we realize how many times Jesus and the, uh, the apostles and, and uh, the writers of the New Testament would quote something from the Old Testament. How many of we understand when we get to the book of Revelation that when he's feel kind of the need to just maybe I'm a voice sometimes that feels like it's swimming against the tide but I think there's some stuff that people preach that just you know there's really no Bible for it because you don't you don't compare uh, spiritual things with newspapers I'm gonna wait on you a minute you compare spiritual things with spiritual things and so if you get to the book of Revelation and it has a lamb in there that's been slain you have to think in your mind where else did I see a lamb well, it was in the book of Exodus, where that lamb would bring them in an exodus that they would put the blood of the, of the lamb on the doorpost of the house, and that would signal that it's time for an exodus. And how many know that when he said, if you put the blood on the doorpost of the house, I'm going to pass through the land of Egypt, and I'm going to smite all the firstborn. There was a whole lot of plagues that built up to that. And he said, I'm going to smite all the firstborn of Egypt. I kind of think it might have been a little bit of them reaping what... but it's a lot of stuff in my books about this but I preached a message back some time ago where God said to me uh, you ate your way into this problem you can eat your way out of it I said Lord what do you mean he said you started with an eating disorder in Eden's misty garden when I said don't eat that but you ate that and God
and drinking. I wish I could get some help in here already. Hallelujah. And so they said, let's eat. And she said, well, let's eat some lamb. Hallelujah. Y'all touch your neighbor and say, eat nothing but mutton. Hallelujah. of the blood of the lamb said to the death angel is there's already been a death exacted here the death of the lamb was the death of the firstborn how many know that jesus didn't die so you don't have to how many he died because you had to and he come on somebody how he died not to give you life he died to give you a death Hallelujah. And the moment you start to feed on that, it starts to bring you up out of the land of bondage. And, you know, you would think that it would signal uh, all the way through the scripture. The moment the Bible opens in the New Testament with Matthew 3, John the Baptist jumps up. He's to prepare the way of the Lord. And he jumps up and says, right there, ladies and gentlemen, is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Something should have resonated within them that says, hey, maybe there's another exodus about to take place here. I don't want to go back and review too much tonight. But when you see all of these pictures of how it looks like a, a, it's a constant review, sometimes we think of it because we get in our culture of how we think, and we wouldn't think in the mind of a Jewish person. But just like I said last night in John 6, Jesus leaves the Feast of Passover. He crosses the Sea of Tiberias. They just left the Passover. They just crossed the sea. Clue, clue, clue. I've seen this movie before somewhere else in the scripture. Where else did they leave the fat feast of Passover and cross the sea? It was in Exodus after they ate the lamb. And so they cross the sea and they're in the wilderness and the people are hungry and God gives them manna to eat. In Jesus' day, John chapter 6, they leave the feast of Passover. They cross the sea of Tiberias. They're in the wilderness and the multitude is hungry. And Jesus says to them, you need to feed these people. And he said it to his disciples to see what they would do because he himself knew what he would do. The reason he knew what he would do is because this is not the first time he ever fed a multitude in the wilderness. And then he begins to take the bread and multiplies it. He blesses it. He breaks it. He gives it to the multitudes. And he feeds the multitude, and they take up 12 baskets full of fragments. I'm throwing a lot out here tonight. That's a basket for each apostle. Because I mean, they were to carry the message of what this means to the other side. And the other side was the new covenant side. And once you start carrying the message of the new covenant, you get contrary wind against your ship. Come on, somebody. And it may not even look like Jesus is with you in the beginning, but he'll show up in the middle of a storm. Hallelujah. And I, hallelujah. And you will make it to the other side. Don't want to chase that rabbit either. But they feed the multitude, and a multitude are fed. And then they ask Jesus, having just seen 5,000 men, not counting women and children, fed. They look at Jesus and said, what sign do you show us that you're the Christ? I, 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 I think Jesus probably just went, need to do for you people I mean you got and then he quotes something that should connect it immediately to the exodus he said your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they're dead but I am the true bread that came down from heaven and I'm here to lead you on another exodus see I think there's still a lot of people in bondage tonight and as I showed you before, how I many of what we're just in bondage to is not necessarily the world. There is a release from the slavery of the world. I, actually, I'm trying not to go back over last message, but last night's message. But Revelation 11, verse 8 is a real powerful verse that says, For their dead bodies, talking about the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, he said, Their dead bodies, which symbolize the law and the prophets, shall lie in the great city, the, the, the street of the great city, 
which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And it never dawns on us that our Lord was not crucified in Sodom or Egypt. He was crucified in Jerusalem, the centerpiece of Old Covenant Judaism. And what we realize then is the Holy Spirit has taken his finger and he said, what you thought was Egypt is not Egypt. The bondage I want to lead them out of is I sent my son born of a woman born under the law to redeem them who were under the law. Part of your redemption is not just from sin. It's to redeem you from the curse of the law. Some folk don't even know what they've been saved from or the penalties even of the law. How many know Jesus came and took every penalty the law had and took it and nailed it to the cross? Colossians chapter 2 said he took the handwriting of ordinance that was against us and it nailed it to the cross. The handwriting of ordinance was written on stone. And hallelujah, that's not my opinion And he takes that and says he disarmed principalities and powers by taking the handwriting of ordinance and nailing it to the cross, triumphing over them in it. But here's what we do every Sunday morning. We go get that weapon of the enemy and we put it right back in the hand of the enemy. I wonder who some of these preachers work for who get back up every Sunday morning and rearm the enemy with condemnation. But I got some good news for you. No weapon formed against you can prosper. And any tongue that rises up in view of judgment or condemnation, you will utterly condemn because your righteousness is of me, said the Lord. In other words, in the new covenant, your righteousness Righteousness is not based on what you did. It's based on what he did. I wish I could get somebody to eat some lamb with me tonight. Hallelujah. Because the more I've begun to feed on this thing, this whole covenant, this, uh, the old covenant, was about trying to modify the behavior of an old man. The new covenant is about, come on, maturing and, 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 and raising up and feeding a new creation and bringing him back to the revelation of his identity of who he is in this new creation. And the moment you start to do that, you're going to have to decide who you're going to preach to. And when you start to decide, I'm either going to preach to Adam and modify his behavior, help me, Holy Ghost, uh, because if I do that, then I'm going to do what Paul said not to in Romans 12. He said, do not be conformed. Because if you're under law, you are being conformed. Hallelujah. But if you're under grace, you are being transformed. There's a massive difference. See, change is absolutely in play here. It's what, 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 what produces that that I'm trying to talk about. And the more people look at you and say, well, you guys preaching this grace stuff. You're all causing people to sin. I'm saying, man, let me tell you something. There's a whole lot of people who've got their act together, and it's just an act. There's a whole lot of people who know how to put on their precious Jesus face and their public profile and act like they're holy and they glow in the dark. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. But when you, when you all of a sudden you begin to realize that these people are not as holy as you think they are and they've all seemed like to keep the rules. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. I think I'm a recovering Pharisee tonight. I think I'm still in recovery because sometimes I still default back to that old thing where I want to point out, thank God I'm not like that sinner. And the truth of it is we measure people by the standards of stuff that wasn't even biblical. Hallelujah. And we preach the wrong covenant and wonder why we end up with the results that the same old covenant did because when you preach the old covenant, it shuts up faith and people start getting condemned and they start to not even believe they're saved anymore. I ain't getting very far tonight. I can remember sitting under, that's about the time I thought I was saved growing up in classical Pentecost, about the time I thought I was saved and wouldn't have to go to the altar again this Sunday morning, hallelujah, because they talked me out of my salvation every time they, I, I got up. And about the time I thought I don't have to get saved again this morning, they come up with a new sin and there I was lost again. Because we measured the success of a service by how many people we got to come back to the altar again. And then we could leave there and brag and say, I had 150 people got saved last night. But they failed to tell us it's the same 150 people got saved the last time they came. And they'll be back in three months more to do the same thing. And you get on this repetitious, come on, treadmill of a life. And somewhere something dawns on you, there's got to be something more than this. And some people never come to that. And they all, they'll all walk away. What happened to me at the age of in my teenage years? I thought, you know what? I love God, but he evidently don't love me. And of all this stuff is going to take me to hell, there's a pretty good chance I'm not going to make it and if I'm going to die and go to hell at least I'm going to enjoy the ride 
And so I walked away from the things of God, and I started finding out, man, that as I visited some of the stuff that my brother works with, the rehab stuff and a lot of uh, substance abuse stuff, I started looking, uh, going to jail services and preaching in jail, different things like that over the years, started to realize, wait a minute, these people have already been to our churches. They've already been disenfranchised by a system that constantly pushed them away and disqualified them and made them feel rejected and unloved and unaccepted. And so they finally got weary with it and said, you know what, man? Hallelujah. Like, if I get my act together, I, I, I'm going to come back to church. And I said, man, if you get your act together, it's just an act. But, brother, how's that come to church? But I can't live it. I said, welcome to the party. Hallelujah. Somebody said to me one day, you guys preaching grace are preaching grace because there's sin in your life. I said, you better believe it. <laughs> well, I'll try it on this side. Listen, man, I'm authentic. I'm genuine. I, listen, I still need a Savior myself. And from this pulpit to the door, if it's not grace, come on, it ain't none of us going to make it in. That's not an excuse for bad behavior. It's just trying to tell you from the pulpit to the door, every one of us in this room need a Savior. We need help. The whole point of the law, Romans 1, 2, and 3, we're filming that right now for TV. The whole point of Romans 1 and 2 and 3 is the diagnosis of the human condition. And what he does is he indicts everything and everybody, the insider, the outsider, the Jew, the Gentile, the holy dude. Come on. Everybody in the book. And he says, and here's, I love it from the Message Bible. He says, we're all in the same sinking boat. Every last single one of us. Hallelujah. We all need a Savior. There's none righteous. No, not even one. And the point of the law is to bring you to the end of yourself where you say, I think I need a Savior. And it points you to Christ. And then you get the good news, the gospel. The gospel is he did everything, hallelujah, that the law required to take the handwriting of ordinance that was against you and move it out of the way so that you could come up out of the bondage, not just of the world. That's included of slavery. But to come up out of the bondage, see, because I believe where we're really at right now on a global level is we are coming up out of religious bondage. And what we've done is export an American gospel all over the world. Oh, I wish I had all night tonight. And half the problems we have in our world today is because of religious stuff and bad theology. And if you don't think that, it, that theology is important, it's just even what we do in the Middle East or what we do with all kinds of stuff is a result of our, of our theologies. Well, thank you for that thunderous amen. Hallelujah. It affects stuff. What we believe affects things. Hallelujah. And, and what I'm simply saying is, is I believe that God is bringing an adjustment. And there is, a, there, is, there is something, I believe, happening right now that's bigger than revival. Now, I certainly don't fight revival. If that's what you want to call it, that's what you think is happening in your church. I'm not a, opposed. But I really believe that we are in the, uh, the, the, the very throes of a reformation, of apostolic prophetic reformation where there is a return back again to a new covenant paradigm where we're not preaching the mixture of law and grace but we're preaching the, the new covenant we're preaching Jesus and not Moses we're preaching come on hallelujah he's the door that's not the door come on he's the bread that's not the bread hallelujah he's the vine that's not the vine hallelujah and so this exodus that's all the way through the Gospels, especially and in the New Testament, is Jesus coming, first of all, to his own, to a Jewish audience, to try to bring them up out and bring them into a redemption from the law of the Mosaic system that they are under. Go ahead and bring me up 1 Corinthians 10. I have preached probably 20 minutes and haven't even got to a text yet. First, did you have it? Oh, you can't. You don't have it. It won't come up. Let me just read it to you. This is, moreover, brethren, I do not want to, you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as they were, some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. 
nor let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also, and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Here's the key verse. Now, all of these things happened to them as examples. Now, if this doesn't give me something to hang this on, I don't know what does. Here is Paul writing to the church in Corinth, and he said, everything that they saw by type and shadow, a lamb, come on, manna in the wilderness, a serpent on a pole, a rock that was smitten, the rock was Christ, the bread was Christ. Jesus himself quotes the scripture, even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, and if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And this spake he concerning what death he would die. Jesus was fulfilling all of these patterns as an example that in a Jewish mindset should have screamed, there must be another exodus about to take place here. Now they were thinking he's going to redeem us from Rome, but he was going to redeem them from more than Rome. He was going to redeem them from their own religious backgrounds and their own, come on, failed system that was only declared to be uh, an addendum until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Galatians 3 said the law was added until the seed should come to whom the promise, and that seed was Christ. I love how people, uh, you know, cherry picks things from the scriptures and tell you, well, you can, you know, this. Brother Hobbs, we're under the law. But we want to pick and choose what fits our culture. We call that the gospel. And all my years of hearing all of the stuff being preached, it was preached against when I was growing up. Never heard anybody ever preach against catfish. But same law that says you, come on. The same law that says women don't dress in men's apparel that we used to beat women up for years. Also says don't mix your thread in the garment with divers kinds of thread. Don't mix with wool and linen. So if you've got on a polyester rayon suit tonight, you may be in real trouble. (laughs) Or a wool suit and cotton underwear. Ouch, hallelujah. (laughs) Y'all don't want to help me preach here. Hallelujah. And, and, or, or, or if you ate a, a bottom feeder, but didn't have fins and, and scales on it, you couldn't eat it. And, and you know, there was a whole list of stuff that you don't read because we won't read Deuteronomy. I call it the book of Deuteronomy because it's more about what you Deuteronomy than you Deuteronomy. Book of Numbers. But I'm going to tell you what, if you don't understand the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Numbers, you won't understand the book of Revelation. Because the book of Revelation is God keeping his end of the covenant bargain of the Mosaic law and bringing upon them all the curses that were written in the book because they did not receive the blood of the lamb that God had sent and put it on the doorpost of their house. And interestingly enough, God gave them 40 years. I'm getting way ahead of myself. God gave them 40 years to repent and come out of that old covenant. Now watch this. Go back to Corinthians. All these things happened to them as examples. Is it too... Did I tell you too late? All these things happen in examples, and they were written for our admonition. Anybody got their uh, regular King James Bible with you? Just regular King James? Who's got one? Who does? Corey does? Corey, would you read that verse? All these things. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Watch this. All these things happen to them. For examples, for us, Mm -hmm. watch this, upon whom the ends of the world are now come. Now, now stay here with me. I'm going to stretch you a bit tonight. I guess I'm safe here. Give me a nod if I shouldn't say some of this. (laughs) Upon whom the ends of the world. Here's, here's, here's Here's a game changer. King James and the original translates that word. Upon whom the ends of the world have come. And many places throughout the scripture, including Matthew 24, that says what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world is the same Greek word. But it is not the word world in every other translation and even in the New King James when they correct it. The word world here is not talking about a global catastrophe. It's the Greek word age or eon, and he's not talking about the end of the world. He's talking about the end of an age. That's a game changer. The end of what age, Brother House? The end of the old covenant age. 
And guess who he was writing to? Not you. He was writing to the church at Corinth, and he was telling them, you're the people upon whom the ends, if I read it to you here, let me read it to you from the New King James. Now, all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends, plural, of the ages, plural, have come. He tells them, you at Corinth are the people upon whom the ends, plural, of the ages, plural, had now come. So when I teach this in leadership stuff, I'm sharing some stuff tonight that I don't really share a lot of, a lot of bigger places. But in, and there's a lot of people watching probably online because I shared it across my social media platform. But I'm too old to mess around now, so I'm just going to preach it what I can. Hallelujah. i got to get some of this out of my system. Hallelujah. If you could picture this in your mind, see, you see this circle right here? That's the old covenant age. And this circle right here is the new covenant age. And they will overlap like the MasterCard insignia. Can you see that in your eyes, mine? Right here where these two ages converge, they, they overlap, and there is a 40-year gap that the whole New Testament is written from the time of Jesus who gives the prophecy in Matthew 24. Here, I'm getting a little deeper than I want to tonight. He gives the prophecy in Matthew 24. He's standing there pointing at the physical, literal buildings of the temple. He said, do you see all these things? Not one stone will be left on another that will not be thrown down. He's talking not about the end of the world global. He's talking about the end of the age of the law and the centerpiece of that Judaistic system and animal sacrifice, which was Jerusalem. And he's saying to them that... prophecies that are about to fail that people are screaming and scry- they're Old Testament prophets and I'm telling you I think God is trying to shift us from being Old Covenant prophets to being New Covenant prophets instead of crying doom and despair start to train people for reigning and to engage our culture and to engage our world and change our world rather than trying to get ready to escape it I think that we, if we could ever do that we would become an effective force in the earth the devil don't care what you believe as long as you think you're headed to heaven any minute now and don't worry about the rest of it but the moment you start to realize that God has raised up a chosen generation and a royal priesthood and a people in the earth to engage the earth with the gospel not come on of just salvation but the gospel of the kingdom and the reign of the king because he himself declared of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end hallelujah that's good news so somebody said to me in a question well if it was the ends of the ages that had now come what does that mean it means that it was the back end of the old covenant age and the front end of the new covenant age, hence the ends of the ages had come upon that generation. And interestingly enough, that generation from the time Jesus gave that prophecy in 30 AD, and they asked him, when will this happen? He says, this generation right here will not pass away until all these things come to pass. I didn't say it, Jesus did. C.S. Lewis, who is a respected theologian, who I respect, made the statement of Matthew 24 concerning Jesus. He said it's one of the most embarrassing exhibitions of error in the scripture is that Jesus missed it prophetically. And do you know that Bible schools, liberals, not Bible schools, but liberal schools use those scriptures to dismantle the faith of our children to tell you you can't trust the scripture because Jesus said it would happen, the end of the world would happen while that first generation was alive. Well, the problem is with translation. It was not the end of the world, and the world did not end. I got some good news for you. I think it's good news. We are living in a world without end. To him be glory in the churches throughout all generations, world without end. Hallelujah. I'm not worried about the the end of the world. And I didn't mean to get over on all this tonight. Hallelujah. But we, we are not living. We need to someplace shift to the point where we realize that we need to lose our last day mentality and get a new day mentality and start to step into our promised land. And Hallelujah. Because we're 2,000 years into this and I still got to convince people as to what covenant they're under.
And if we're still under the old covenant, we need to start stoning some folks. Well, hello. I mean, if you're going to keep the law, you've got to keep the whole law. You can't pick and choose some of it. You've got to do the whole thing, you know. If your children don't behave, take them out to the elders of the city. Just stone them to death, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean, there's some, there's some, there, if you read, most people just glance over Deuteronomy numbers, all the stuff that went in, because it was part of that old covenant mentality that he was trying to bring them out of. So when he said they've come to the ends of the ages, he was talking about the back end of the old covenant age and the beginning of the new covenant age. Jesus gave the prophecy in Matthew chapter 24 in 30 AD, and he tells them this will happen before this generation, this generation passes. A generation is 40 years exact amount of time as the wilderness journey and every miracle Jesus does has to do with even a picture of him trying to bring them up out of that bondage including the man who's laying at the pool of Bethesda which means the house of mercy or the house of grace who had been there 38 years that was the amount of time the children of Israel had lived in the in the wilderness after they forfeited the the the, the uh, Abrahamic covenant it was 38 years and there's a man laying at the pool one man and Jesus walks up and says do you want to be made whole because he knows there's a whole bunch of impotent folk here and a whole bunch of lame folk the whole house of Israel that don't want to hallelujah they're waiting on the troubling of the water but what would trouble the water is they would wash the lambs upstream and it would pull, pull, run from I believe it was the pool of Siloam down into the pool of Bethesda and they would cut the throats of the lambs upstream and when the blood of the lamb would hit the water it would trouble the water and whoever got in got healed here's the real lamb of God standing right there in front of them and said listen I'm going to show you another picture that your wilderness journey can be over if you will simply receive your Messiah who has now come I'm telling you it gets pretty clear when he rides in into town on a donkey and said, Behold, your king comes to you riding on a colt. I'm a mess. <laughs> Hallelujah. And th that should have been key number one is, Behold, your king comes to you. He fulfilled Zechariah chapter 9 that said, Behold, your king. Zechariah said to, that you will find your king riding on a colt and the foal of an ass. And Jesus rides into town and they start to cry, Hosanna, because they're expecting a kingdom that would be like David to come and overthrow the Romans. But Jesus said, I came to tell you something. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, my servants would fight. But even though my kingdom is not of this world, it is for this world. But the kingdom is not, come on, fighting and weapons and politics. It's righteousness, peace, and joy. It's located in the Holy Ghost. And the kingdom came 2,000 years ago and has been growing ever since. Now, don't get too excited if I tell you good news and you leave here without a bunch of doom. It amazes me that people get mad when you take their doom and despair from them. I mean, just the possibility that I could be right, I'd think, oh, God, I want to at least entertain this thought a minute. What if it don't fall apart for my children and my grandchildren? I'm not saying there's not some very real problems in our planet right now. But you know what? They thought it was all over back in, in when the World War I. Thought it was over in World War II. Thought it was over, come on somebody, when Sadat was in, uh, when, when, when Menachem Begin was in, when Gorbachev was in, when, when, come on, hallelujah, Obama, Osama, Chelsea's mama, the last Trump, you name it, they all had a place to preach it from. Now it's Putin. Hallelujah, and Gog and Magog and Ezekiel 37 and 38 was fulfilled in the book of Ezra. Hallelujah. We try to hang that out in some kind of a future prophecy. And don't realize these prophecies were given to specific people in specific time dates. And what that says to me then is if Jesus gave this prophecy, let me calm down and teach a little. He gives this prophecy in 30 AD, and everything he says comes to pass in 70 AD looks to me like Jesus didn't miss. I, I, let me just submit something to you. Consider the possibility that Jesus wasn't a false prophet. <laughs> Consider the possibility that he was right, but we might have been wrong in how we interpret it. <clears throat> Wouldn't that be incredibly good news? Yeah. Hallelujah. And see, what was supposed to happen is that whole transition for that 40 years, you see them at Acts 15 trying to figure out what stays and what goes. Should we circumcise these Gentiles that are getting saved? Do we need to eat these things? In other words, they're, they're, they're trying to figure out what stays and what goes. Because it's a whole new world for them. They are coming out 
and they're in an exodus. Now let me show you this because also the book of Revelation, he starts out by saying this is a revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave to his servant to show them the things which must shortly come to pass. Say shortly. Hallelujah. He said these things, and he reiterates that several times. The, those who pierce me will come on me. The fact the book of Revelation talks about these battles being fought with horses and swords and spears ought to be a clue that this is first century stuff. When he said shortly come to pass, that doesn't mean 2,020 years and counting. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh, well, God, time is like, well, you know, God is, you know, his time is nothing with God. Well, if you tell me go out in the car and wait, you're going to come very shortly. And in 2,022 years from now, I haven't made it yet. Just, just go on without me. <laughs> See, we're so enamored with the coming Jesus that we forget about the one that's already in the room. Yeah. Hallelujah. Somebody said, you think, brother, that Jesus is, 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 is still coming? I think he's a, he could appear in a whole lot of different ways. I think he could walk through that wall tonight. I think, come on, hallelujah, he could show up in any form he wants to. Sometimes he shows up as the homeless person on the street that you walk by. Because as much as you've done to the least of these, you've done it to me. The problem I have with the Jesus living in Jerusalem is i got to go on a jet to you go see him, and I checked airfares today, man, and they were out the roof, hallelujah, not just out to Israel, but to Tulsa, Oklahoma was 1200 bucks, hallelujah, and I'm like, well, I've never seen prices that high, but let me tell you, and then you got to stand in a long line to have an audience with him, because everybody's going to want to talk to him, but you know what, I don't have to leave this room tonight to come boldly to the throne of grace, I could just shut you out, come on, just like the guy that was singing a while ago, I could walk up into the presence of God, and I've got a private audience with the King of Kings, and and the Lord of Lords who said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Hallelujah. So somebody needs to realize Jesus is here. Yeah. Hallelujah. In other words, we don't think he's here unless we get a goosebump and everybody falls over on the floor. But sometimes the move of the Holy Ghost will shift a culture. Sometimes the move of the Holy Ghost will change stuff. See, when Reformation hits, uh, it was like Azusa Street. A black man, a, a, a white man, and a woman got together on Azusa Street. Something totally out of the culture. It was against the rules for women to even vote or blacks and whites to mix. But when they got together at Azusa Street, God said, I think this is what the kingdom would look like. And he poured the Holy Ghost out and the kingdom begin to come and we experience and enjoy the power of the Azusa Street revival today because of what happened there. It shifted culture. When Luther stood up and said the just will live by faith, it began to affect everything from even industry and wealth. And people started to realize you can paint something more than just a religious painting on a ceiling. There's great music that came out of that era. The invention of the printing press. All kinds of stuff came as a result of the move of the Holy Ghost. I, I think we're in a reformation. If you're crying doom and despair, that's up to you. I can only preach what I think the Holy Ghost said to me. And that is somewhere there's going to be a people who begin to arise in the midst of darkness darkness and begin to shine for the light has already come and the glory of the Lord is risen on you hallelujah and that God said even when they came out of Egypt I'm going to put a difference between you and the Egyptians hallelujah the blood is going to be the difference. I'm going to make a difference between. He said, not upon one cow, not upon one dog. You're not going to hear a sound. When the plagues were falling in Egypt, come on. There was blood on the doorpost of the house in Egypt. The blood still speaks. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so as he begins to come through the book of Revelation, what you see in this transition of the people upon whom the ends of the ages had come, this book is written to seven churches that were really in Asia. They are not mystical churches of seven ages. Nothing to hang that on. <laughs> there were seven real churches in Asia that were in the transition. And every I, in my first book, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, don't have you with me, but you can, it's online. I deal with the first five chapters. I need to write a whole lot more. And some of this that I'm going to share with you tonight is the beginnings of some stuff I'm going to write. If I can get there, hallelujah, because I will not share this in the morning service, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. And, 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 but but what, what happens is, is that the first seven churches, everything he tells them to repent of means to change the way you think. Repent, metanoia, is to catapult them into a new covenant way of thinking. 
And so for the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, he's trying to get them to shift how they think to be able to come into the kingdom. Because if you can repent, in the first church he says, you've, you've worked and you've labored and you've labored and worked. The first thing he's going to address is what works and labor. And you did it for my name's sake. I mean, I, listen, man, when I was in that stuff, I did it because I love Jesus. I mean, let me just say something. You know, really, I'm trying to be really gracious here tonight. But I have respect for the people I came up under because they did the best they could with what they knew. They preached what they thought they knew, and they thought that's what God wanted them to say. And I, I respect that. I came up under that. But see, i got to tell you, man, if God starts to speak something, we need to be able to move and say, okay, that was truth for that moment, but now we need to keep on moving because the cloud has moved. And if God's calling his church to repent, maybe it's time for us to, to change our minds. So for the first three chapters, and he starts to deal with works and labor. And then he tells them, if you can repent, I'm going to give to you to eat. He said, remember from whence thou art fallen. And then he says, if you overcome, I'll give you to eat of the tree of life. So I'm thinking, he's not talking about remember where you fell from last night. He's talking about remember what caused the original fall. What caused the original fall? You ate from the wrong tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil that created works and labor. But if you can repent, I'm going to give you the tree of life. And there's a shift all through that. All That's all through those seven churches. Now, let me take you over here to the third chapter of Revelation and see if I can plug in here. Man, I'm a mess here. Let me just see if I can get this. Revelation 3. Let's go to the very last church in Revelation. And the angel of the church, verse 14, of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that thou art neither cold or hot. I wish you were cold or hot, so that because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich in white garments, and you may that the, and you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see as many as I love and rebuke, and uh, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Now, stay with me just for a moment. I think that one way to look at this is: I would that you were hot or cold. Say it this way: I wish you were either old covenant or new covenant. But if you're trying to hold on to both of them, Paul calls it a perversion of the gospel. Paul calls falling from grace, not sinning last night. He calls falling from grace, going back up under the law. That's what he calls falling from grace. You'll get quiet on me. And he says, listen, I want you to change the way you think. Because as many as I love, here's, that's, that's powerful. Because he said, I'm trying to give you something, not because I'm angry with you, but because I love you enough to send somebody to try to change the way you think. And then he says this, behold, I stand at the door. Everybody say door. And knock. Everybody say Door. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. And all of a sudden, I started, wait a minute, sup with me is a covenant meal term. It's not an accident that this is the last church he dresses. He says, if you can change the way you think about this mixture, I will come into you and sup with you. I'm going to eat the covenant meal and you're going to realize this is, in fact, the Passover. The night before his decease, he said, with great desire, have I desired to eat this Passover with you. And the reason he did was because he knew it was the last time they would ever have to kill a woolly lamb. This would be the last Passover. This is the Exodus. Come on, somebody. And then after his resurrection, he's on the road to Emmaus. I call it Heartburn Road because they got the heartburn. Hallelujah. And they're walking, and Jesus appears, and they don't recognize him. See, sometimes Jesus shows up in a different way than you expected him, and you don't know it's him. I want to, I want to tell stories here, but I'm going to keep moving. And so they're walking, and they're talking, and, and they look over Jesus and said, Are you only a stranger here? And you don't know what has occurred here these three days and three nights? 
He's probably the only man on the planet who really understood what happened three days to the next. And he, the Bible said, and he beginning with Moses began to tell him all things concerning himself. So for seven miles, he's telling him, remember that lamb? I was the lamb. You remember the tabernacle? I was the tabernacle. Come on, somebody. Do you remember? All, in other words, he started, remember the serpent on the pole? I just fulfilled that. You remember that lamb? I was the fulfillment of that lamb. And they still, their eyes were holding. So they get to the place where they're staying. And Jesus acts as if he's going to go beyond. And they constrain him to come in. I love this. But when Jesus sat down, he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it. And their eyes were open, and they knew him in the breaking of the bread. All of a sudden, it dawned on them, this is what he meant the night before the Passover. And he always takes the bread, blesses the bread, breaks the bread, and he gives it to the multitude and signaled, boys, I'm telling you, hallelujah, I've risen from the dead, and a new leader, come on, a greater than Moses is on the scene now. Hallelujah. And I'm going to bring you out, but I'm not going to bring you out of what you thought I was going to bring you out of. I'm going to bring you out of spiritual bondage because the kingdom does not come with observation, he says in Luke 17. That doesn't mean you can't see it. He's talking about it doesn't come with the observances of touch not, taste not, handle not. Paul said, I'm afraid of you, Galatians, because you have gone back up under the law and you touch not, taste not, you observe feast and months and times. And I'm a, In other words, the kingdom doesn't come through the observances. It comes in the Holy Ghost. How many of you got the Holy Ghost today? Got the Spirit of God living inside of you? Then you're just full of the kingdom. Come on, somebody. Matter of fact, I'm going to shake the hand of the prime minister tonight. Of this house. Come on, hallelujah. There's some delegates here. I'm going to shake the hand of a delegate. That's delegated authority in his city. I wish I could get some help here. Hallelujah. There are, what we don't realize is there are spheres of influence that God has given to us to establish and do something in the earth to advance the kingdom because the kingdom of God is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of meal until the whole thing's infected. But he says, I stand at the door. If you overcome, I'll open the door to me. I'll come in and, and sup with him. He with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant him to sit with me in my throne. Everybody say throne. As I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So he says, if you overcome, I'm going to sup with you. I stand at the door and knock. Everybody say door. Everybody say throne. Next chapter. Except there's no chapters or verses separated in the original language. It says after this. After what? After you change the way you think. I looked and behold a door. Everybody say door. door. Open in heaven. Is that your neighbor say same door he was knocking on in the verse above? Same context. He's about to open the door. And he, then he goes on. He goes and says this. Watch this. He says, and the first vo voice which I heard was as a trumpet talking with me saying, come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit. Behold, a throne set in heaven. Everybody say a throne. That's the same throne he just invited you to three verses above that. See, we get this up in our imagination that this is where we went to heaven. Somewhere between chapter 3 and chapter 4, we went to heaven. What this is about is the kingdom being open to a people, and immediately he says... I was in the spirit, and the throne was set in heaven, one sat on the throne. He who sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine, a stardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And the throne proceeded lightning, thunders, and voices, seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, st stay with me just a minute. He opens the door to the throne he just invited them if you overcome you can sit with me in my throne and then he says i saw a door open and a throne do you know the word church then from revelation 3 on is never mentioned again in the book of revelation so i said god why was the church never mentioned now most most a lot a lot of prophecy teachers tell you it's because the church was raptured out and they were taken out. And I said, such an important event. You'd have thought God would have put that somewhere in that verse right there between chapter 3 and chapter 4. At least somebody's footnotes. <laughs> That's not what happened. 
The first usage of the word church is when he calls them the church in the wilderness. And the reason the word church is never used again is because it means the called out ones. But by the time they get to chapter 4 of the book of Revelation, they have not only been brought out, now they have been brought into the kingdom. Hallelujah. And the rainbow that's around the sun is the covenant, the symbol of the new covenant. They've come to the kingdom and come into a new covenant. Now, can, I, I built all this. To, let, me, let me quickly show you something. I built all this to get to, to some of this. Let me just, because this is some stuff I have not shared. Let me just, let me show you some powerful comparisons. Since I just read that, I want to read this to you from Ezekiel. I'm going to read Ezekiel, a few passages, and show you the striking resemblance between Ezekiel 1, 2, and 3 and Revelation chapter 4 and on through a little. We'll just get brush strokes here. Ezekiel 1 says, as the verse uh, Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 10 says, As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion. And on the right side, they four had the face of an ox. And on the left side, they four also had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces and their wings were stretched up, where two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. How many know that's exact replica of the, what's in the book of Revelation? The four-faced living creature. Striking resemblance. Go down to verse 26. It says, and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne. Are you tracking with me? As the appearance of a sapphire stone and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the appearance of a man above it upon it. And I saw the color of amber as the appearance of fire round about within it from the appearance of his loins even upward. And from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire if it had the brightness round about as the appearance of the bow, as the appearance of a bow, that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my feet, and I heard a voice of one that spake. How many can see that's a striking resemblance? Almost looks like you're reading from the book of Revelation. You've got a throne, a rainbow. You've got a four-faced living creature. Are you tracking with me? And I just read it from Revelation, so I won't, I won't go back and look at this. But, and then we go into chapter 2 of Ezekiel, verse 1 through 4. And he said to me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. And the Spirit entered into me, and he spake unto me, and set me upon my feet, that I heard him that spake unto me. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me even unto this day, for they are impudent children and stiff and stiff-hearted, I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. And then verse 8, he says, But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be thou not rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth, and eat that I give thee. And when I looked, behold, and a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written there, Lamentations, mourning, and woe. Striking resemblance of a little book that's in the right hand of the one that's sitting there. Now I'm going to hear this powerful. But you can help me. Just let me let me get this out of my system. In this little book, this little scroll that was written was lamentation, mourning, and woe. Let me make this statement right up front. It is God keeping His end of the bargain to the rebellious house of Israel. That is clearly there. The book of Revelation is not about coming catastrophes. It is about God's judgment on apostate Israel because they rejected their Messiah, killed those who were sent, and stoned the prophets so that Jesus said that upon that generation would come the blood of all the righteous, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah would come on that generation. Can you see the striking resemblances here of these prophets prophesying all that would come to pass? And, and, and you see in Revelation, there's a little book written within and without, sealed with seven seals. Now, we'll get over there and, and compare that in just a moment. But he says, moreover, in chapter 3 uh, of Ezekiel, verse 1, moreover, he said to me, son of man, eat that thou findest and eat this roll and go speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he calls me to eat the roll. And he said unto me, son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then I did eat it. It was in my mouth, sweet, uh, uh, mouth as honey for sweetness. And he said to me, son of man, go get thee to the house of Israel and speak with my words. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you read that in the book of Revelation, he tells John the exact same thing. Take this little book and eat it. It will be sweet in your mouth and bitter in your belly. Can you see the, the comparisons? 
Now, let me just go here in Revelation chapter 5 and it said, uh, and just show this. To me, it's powerful. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals. Now, remember, in this book is lamentation, mourning, and woe. It is God keeping his end of fulfilling the prophetic utterances to judge apostate Israel for the idolatry that we just read about, even in 1 Corinthians 10. He's warning them again, don't murmur, don't be idolatrous, don't do all this stuff. But they keep on not receiving the blood of a spotless lamb so that they are forcing God's hand. There is so much I want to tell you. I just stand here with some... Even give them 490 years to repent. Daniel said, I'll give you 70 times 7. I said, God, why 70 times 7? Why did you give them 490 years? He said, because it's multiples of Sabbaths, it's multiples of Jubilees, and a man must forgive until 70 times 7. So he gave them every opportunity and wept over them. And Matthew 23 said, I would have gathered you under my feathers. His feathers was the mercy seat. I wanted to give you mercy, but you would not. Therefore, your house is left to you desolate, he says to him. And in and, and Luke's gospel of, of the Olivet Discourse, he says, for these are the days of vengeance that all things that were written might be fulfilled. But I love this as we get on time. He takes the little book. He says, is there anybody found worthy? And the elder said, weep not. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And behold, and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four beasts, and in the midst of the elder stood a lamb as if it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth to all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. But this is what I wanted to get to. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and nation and tongue. Hallelujah. Now I want to show you simply this, what he's simply saying to them, for apostate, rebellious Israel, there is lamentation, mourning, and woe. But when the Lamb opened the seal to us who are believers, they sang a new song. And the new song is the new covenant. And what the song that I'm singing tonight is, that's not what you have coming because you're not under that covenant. What I'm singing tonight is a new song. I'm saying, you've been redeemed from all of this. Somebody ought to get happy with me tonight. I said, what I'm telling you is that you have been redeemed because the Lamb has opened the seals and redeemed you by His blood to redeem you from the lamentation, mourning, and woe, hallelujah, that we are beyond that covenant because where the law is, it works wrath, but we are beyond the law, hallelujah, and we are not under wrath, hallelujah. I think that's good news. Everybody's preaching God's mad, and then when He don't kill everybody they think He ought to, they're upset about it. What's wrong with us, man? Hallelujah. He came to seek and to save what was lost. You see him repeat the same thing in 10 of Revelation. There's a mighty angel come down with a rainbow on his hand. He's got a new covenant mentality. Has a little book open. And this little book is open. And he puts one foot on the land and one foot on the sea. And he begins to declare that no more time will intervene. That there will be any more waiting or delay. King James says he declares time no longer. It doesn't mean the clock stopped. What he's saying, the correct translation here is there will be no more intervention that there should be any more waiting or delay. We are not waiting on some of this stuff to come. We are not in the four horses of the apocalypse. All of that came in the first century. And if you read the four horses of the apocalypse, they are the complete, exact fulfillment of Jesus in Matthew 24, who said you're going to have war, you're going to have famine, you're going to have earthquakes, they're going to deliver you up to be killed. All of that stuff happened within the time frame of what Jesus said it would. I'm not saying we don't have some problems in our world. I'm just trying to tell you, you can't hang some future catastrophe on scriptures that are in, come on, hallelujah, have all already been fulfilled one more deal get me this Deuteronomy 31 I'll, I'll pull it up somebody get me Revelation 15 one while I go quickly I'm trying to get down here apologize for preaching so long but let me let me get this there it's only 830 you've watched Netflix longer than this
Deuteronomy 31, verse number 16. They've just read the curses. Deuteronomy 27, 28, 29. If you want to go read all of those and then look at the book of Revelation, you'll see everything he just said would happen under the curses of the law, that he would bring all the plagues of Egypt on them, that he would bring famine, sword, pestilence, locusts would come upon the land, blood would be there, they'd eat their own placenta, they would eat their own children. I mean, Josephus records an incident where a woman took her own kid and was cooking it over the fire because the famine was so bad, and when the Roman soldiers came in, she offered them a bite of it because, and they were so appalled by that, they said, this is not the Romans, this is, a, this is no, no, no less than the wrath and vengeance of God coming upon a people that are that bad. But everything he wrote in Deuteronomy came to pass in the book of Revelation. I have a whole list of scriptures that said, here's the curse given, here's the curse fulfilled. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said, that's some good news. It ought to be. Just the possibility that I could be right could be good. He said, but, but he's telling Moses. So Moses is getting ready to pass off the scene, and God's giving him the final. This is his final words to him. And he's telling him, he said, and the Lord said to Moses, behold, you will rest with your fathers, and this people will rise and play the harlot with the goods, the gods and the foreigners of the land where they go to be among them, and they will forsake me. They'll break my covenant, which I have made with them. Then my anger shall be aroused against them in that day, and I will forsake them and will hide my face from them. And they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Have not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us. And I will surely hide my face in that day, because of all, all the evil which they have done, and that they have turned to other gods. Now, therefore, write down this song. Now, therefore, write down this song for yourselves and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against them. Everybody say song is a witness against them, against the children of Israel. When I have brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey, which, of which I swore to their fathers, and they have eaten and filled themselves and grown fat, then they will turn to other gods and serve them, and they will provoke me and break my covenant. Then it shall be that all, when all the evils and troubles have come upon them, that this song will testify against them as the witness for it will not be forgotten in the mouths of their descendants. For I know the inclination of their behavior today, even before I have brought them to the land which I swore to give them. Therefore Moses wrote this song the same day and taught it to the children of Israel. Then he inaugurated Joshua the son of Nun, said, Be strong, be of good courage. You shall bring the children of Israel into the land which I swore to them, and I will be with you. So it was when Moses had completed writing the words of this law in the book, and when they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenant to take this book of the law and put it beside the Ark, and uh, put it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there's a witness against you. For I know your rebellion and your stiff neck. If today, while I am yet alive with you, you have been rebellious against the Lord, then how much more after my death? Gather me to all the elders of your tribes and to your offers, that I may speak these words to their hearing and call heaven and earth to witness against them. For I know that after my death, you will become utterly corrupt and turn aside from my way, which I have commanded you, and all the evil will befall you. Watch this. In the latter days, not the latter days of this covenant, but the last days of that covenant. And I could do a whole sermon just on that. Because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. Then Moses spoke in the hearing of all the assembly of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. He told them, gave them all the, now somebody get me Revelation 15 real quick and I'm going to close. Revelation 15 verse 1, we'll start reading through there in just a minute. He told them after all the covenant curses. That this stuff is going to come. I think it's, it's just it's amazing that God says to Moses, listen, dude, after you die, these people are going to go whoring after other gods. I'm just going to tell you what they're going to do. And so all of these curses that they've called upon themselves, go back and read them. I mean, it's like reading the book of Revelation. From locusts to whole, the whole shooting match. And he said, these people are going to go out whoring after other gods, and they are going to. So I want you to teach them the song, and they're going to teach it to the generation after them, the generation after them, and after them. They're going to sing the song because it's going to be a reminder because I'm calling heaven and earth to witness against them today that when they break all this stuff and all this stuff comes upon them, they're going to know it's because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord their God. And so Revelation 15 opens and says what? And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them the wrath of God is complete. 
And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God, they sing the song of Moses. What they sing? They sing the song of Moses. Sing the song of Moses, and you're going to teach it to generation after generation after generation so that when all these things come to pass, you're going to know it's me keeping my end of the covenant bargain. And God pours out seven trumpets, seven vows. These are the last plagues. There's no more of them coming. And them has filled up the wrath of God. Come on. And they sang the song of Moses. If that wasn't a nail in the coffin and every Jew standing there knew this is nothing more than the days of vengeance that all things that were spoken would be fulfilled so that what I'm saying in a nutshell, if you didn't get a hold of this tonight, is we have been in an exodus for a long time. But we are not up under the law or the curse of the law under any shape fashion or form I thought I'd get a better amen than that hallelujah that God is not mad with us he is mad about us hallelujah that hallelujah there are some real problems in our world but God is not abandoning us he's trying to raise up a people in the earth now because once the old city there's a tale of two cities in the book of Revelation and as soon as the old city falls a new Jerusalem comes on the scene and the bride the lamb's wife that's you that's the community of faith that's Zion. Come on, somebody, which you are a part of. That ought to be a city set on a hill that cannot be hid, whose gates are never shut day or night. Uh, the Spirit and the bride are always saying, come. Hallelujah. There ought to be an invitation that comes to humanity rather than saying, God is bad with you. God is rejecting you. It's so open wide, her gates. Uh, hallelujah. Because I'm telling you, there's an invitation to a great supper. Ah, I feel like I... I, I feel like I've way overdone it tonight. Hallelujah. But hallelujah, when you realize that all the people that get invited to the great feast when Jesus was here was not the people that were first invited. Come on, the nation of Israel forfeited their right. He said, go out into the highways and get, come on, the halt, the lame, the blind. And do you know what's crazy? Is that everyone that gets invited to the feast uh, when Jesus comes was the ones that were rejected from the feast in the Old Testament book of Leviticus. Because he tells them, if you've got a flat nose, you can't come. If you've got a withered hand, you can't come. If you've got a hunched back, you can't come to eat the bread of your God. If you've got a club foot and you ain't walking in holiness, you can't come. If you've got a running sore, you can't come. If you're a dwarf, you can't come. It disqualifies everything. But in the New Testament, Jesus shows on the scene. He takes a man with a withered hand. He heals him. He takes a woman with a hunchback. It's bowed to the earth and includes her in. Come on. He finds a wee little man, a dwarf in a tree by the name of Zacchaeus. Hallelujah. He invites, come on, somebody with a running sore and a leper who you can't touch. He goes and gets every one of these dudes that wasn't accepted in the old covenant. And he said, go tell them, come to my feast. Uh, these dudes ain't coming, so go get me some folk that'll come to my feast. Hallelujah. Hey, hallelujah. The kingdom of God is about eating and drinking and celebrating the fact, hallelujah, that we are not under mourning and woe. I am preaching to you a new song tonight of the new covenant. It is not about mourning. He's turned our mourning into dancing. When he says to the church in Revelation, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you will be filled. He tells them that. But he also says to them, listen, you're blessed when you're poor in spirit. That's from the quote from the Beatitudes. You're blessed when you're poor in spirit. But if you say, I'm, I'm not poor, I'm rich and increased in goods, but I'm naked, miserable, poor, and blind, then you're going to miss the feast. But if you realize that under the old covenant, you're in a spirit of poverty. If you're under the old covenant, it's time to mourn. In the old covenant, come on, it's time to lose. There's a time and a season for every purpose under the sun. But under the old covenant, it was time to lose, time to die, time for war, time for hate. Come on, somebody. Time to lose, time to mourn, time to be hungry. But in the new covenant, we've changed the code. It's not time for war because Jesus has won the battle. It's not time to mourn because we've got a victory. Hallelujah. We're no longer poor in spirit because we've got righteousness. Hallelujah. We're no longer hungry and thirsty because he said he that comes to me he will never hunger or thirst again. So what time is it? Hallelujah. It's not time to die. I'm about to throw this mic down and run the aisles. I've preached myself happy tonight. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody, sing a new song. Hallelujah. Thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood.
out of every notion, nation, kingdom, and tongue, and you're worthy. Come on, stand on your feet all over this building. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That was a truckload. Hallelujah. Now, I, I always feel, no matter what I do from Revelation, I always feel like I didn't do it justice. There's so much stuff here. So many dots to connect. But if I can just start getting folk to think in terms of covenantal instead of cosmic. That what the prophets were prophesying about was a covenantal collapse and not a cosmic collapse. It wasn't the end of the world as the globe. It was the end of the age of the old covenant. Hallelujah. It was the end of all that was that. And even Jesus stood up as the mediator. And he said, you have heard it said, quoting the law of Moses. But I say, because one greater than Moses is now on the scene. Hallelujah. And I love it because you know what? The new covenant is very similar to the Abrahamic covenant. It's not full of rules. It's only you believe faith. And the new covenant is not even between you and God. It's between God and his son. You're included because of your marriage to him. Hallelujah. And because you're in him. Hallelujah. But when God made promise to his son, that's an irrevocable covenant. Hallelujah. That says, I'm going to bless you. Hallelujah. That I'm favors on us, man. You know what? What you preach manifests. I'm, I'm afraid that a whole lot of stuff we're preaching is just the sky. The sky is falling. Doom and despair is self-fulfilling prophecies. And people try to make it happen. And we need to just stop and pump the brakes a minute and realize what you preach will manifest. You preach on devils, demons will show up. You preach on suffering, people will suffer. That's why Jesus said he sent me to declare the year of the favor of my God. I came to declare, come on somebody. He preached favor right in the midst of political upheaval, Roman occupation. Somebody help. Favor don't always look like favor, but he said, I'm going to preach favor until somebody gets a hold of it. I'm going to bind up the brokenhearted. I'm going to set at liberty them that are bruised. I'm going to declare the acceptable year of the Lord, which was the year of release, the year of Jubilee. And he closed the book. And he didn't say some glad morning in the sweet by and by. He said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Listen, the reason the church is never mentioned after the book of Revelation is not because the church wasn't there. It's because they were no longer in the wilderness. They weren't coming out anymore. They had now come in. Hallelujah. And they were citizens of the kingdom. Now they're called the bride, the lamb's wife, the city of God, the woman. Come on. All through the scripture, you see different symbolisms to show you that powerful truth. I don't know if that blesses you or not. To me, that's better than a personal prophecy. To... I'm amazed sometimes how people can get mad about good news. Somebody said to me, Brother House, what if you're wrong? I said, I'll stand before God and he'll say, thanks for preaching me so big. Wished I could have done that for you, but what if they're wrong? And we've been waiting and waiting and waiting, packed up, prayed up, getting ready to go up. And God's trying to get us to grow up. Hallelujah. Trying to mature us so we can become effective in salt and light in the earth. And then if I'm wrong and Jesus splits Easter sky tonight, I'm with you. Hallelujah. Because my, what I believe about end time events does not determine whether or not I get to go to heaven. So, so that, that's not the issue here. The issue is, though, what we believe about end times determines what we're going to do in the earth and what we're going to do with our lives. I'm dealing with preachers the same age as I am this year. I, I know I preach too long. But this year, I've turned 65. We're starting to navigate the waters of, of Medicare right now, my wife and I. I have to shake my head and say, how did this happen? How did I get here this fast? Pump the brakes. And, you know, and, and, but I'm dealing with a lot of pastors that went in ministry the same time I did that opted out of Social Security and retirement because they didn't think they'd be here. And now they don't have no Social Security, don't have no income. Homeboy believed this for a long time, and guess what? I prepared because I plan on being here for a long time. I believe God gives us the power to get wealth so that his covenant can be established in the earth. 
And I think if we start teaching people that kind of stuff, see, there's, they told me I didn't need an education in high school because I'd never see the end of the 70s. Surely Jesus would be back. In the 80s, I've survived at least 10 to the end of the world stuff. So you, you, <laughs> Whoops, said the Lord, we were wrong again, but we keep on writing the books. And then I just tell them, can I have a shot at this? Look, can I at least consider the possibility that there might be another view that might be incredibly good news? And you would be surprised the people who know what I'm preaching is true who are the heads of denominations that I have met with in private. I call them Nick at night. And if they're watching, hello. They don't want to be seen with me in public. Hallelujah. But hallelujah. So major denominations. So we, uh, uh, said to me, all of, our, all of our educated guys believe what you're preaching. Everybody from the master's clear up to the doctor. The pastor sitting there with him said, why don't we preach it? He said, because it would split the church right down the middle. He said, you want us to lie to the people? See, somewhere, somebody's going to get the guts to preach something. And I've been doing this my whole life when it wasn't popular, but i got to tell you, man, it's catching on all over the world, and it is shifting stuff like crazy right now. And I tell you what, I've been hated so long, it's almost hard for me to be celebrated, but they are coming out of the woodwork everywhere, and young preachers, young 30, 40-year-old guys that are saying, you know what, it's time for a change. This is not your father's Oldsmobile. Hallelujah. This is a gospel. There's some, come on, hallelujah, some folk that, that don't just get up and, and ho hoot and holler because they heard somebody else preach something that ain't even in the Bible, don't know how to write divide the word of truth. There's some scholarly stuff. See, one of the things that's really lacked is we've been 40 miles wide and a half inch deep in most churches. We've got all spirit and no word or all word and no spirit. We don't need either or. We need both of them. We, we need some scholarly work to be done. Hallelujah. To, to begin to shift how people think and preach. Because I'm going to tell you, we don't even know how to sometimes preach the new covenant. There's a shift coming. Hallelujah i got to get out your road tonight. Hallelujah. Sing something while I decide what else I want to do if I want to do anything. Hallelujah. Just sing something real quick. Can we just worship the Lord for a moment? Can we just worship because we think it's possibly good news? Can we just worship because he really has redeemed us to God by his blood? Out of every nation and kingdom. And, and he said, when they started to cry holy, then the four and twenty elders started crying holy. And then... Everybody in the earth and under the earth started crying, holy. There was a trickle-down effect. Because there's something about knowing you've been redeemed from the curse of the law. That lightning and thunder and judgment is not about to hit you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.